Welcome back, friends. Today, we're in a location I've never recorded at, but I've been to many times over the years. We're down at the Plus in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, with a guest who, this is her first time performing here. She's on a national tour all over the country. Um, she has a Netflix special out, which is If You Didn't Want Me Then. Nailed it. Wow. And an HBO special called Girl Daddy. Uh, welcome to the show, comedian Beth Stelling. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. Oh my God, thanks for being here. Yeah. This is pretty cool. So you said you were in Eau Claire briefly with friends or something years ago, right? But that was your only time here? Yeah. Um, we were here, I'm trying to think, it was just before Christmas, because I remember we were staying and the neighbor dropped off some cookies in the shape of reindeer. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yes. It, we were working on um, a little comedy short film thing with some some friends that I had known in Chicago. Yeah, because your your backgrounds in theater way like originally, so yeah. you do a lot of things outside of stand up, right? Yeah, I was a. I don't. It's like I don't technically call myself a theater kid because I I never took it super serious as a kid. I, I think, you know, like my mom wasn't a stage mom, for example. Yeah, okay. Um, but she was always very encouraging because she's a pianist. So it was like cool. she was always supportive of my uh, theatrical endeavors. Sure. Did she push you to play piano or any she instrument? She never pushed. She was a Yamaha teacher, which was... Uh, did you ever know of that? Uh -uh. Basically, I, I guess it was... I mean, obviously, it's the name on some right. of the keyboards, but it was also the name of like the course that you would go take. So she was a oh. Yamaha teacher under this woman that we all took from, named Mrs. Vallow, who was like a beloved teacher of me and my sisters. But I, it never really stuck with me. I was maybe a little too antsy or something <laughs> to sit still and learn. I didn't practice as, as much as I should have. I didn't necessarily, there were several things I didn't follow in my si older sister's footsteps and piano and ballet were, were two of those things. I feel like that translates to how many different things you do now. Like you pop around <laughs> and do a lot of projects. So for the people, what all do you currently do besides stand up? Cause it's a bunch. Okay. Uh, yes. I like to consider myself a real Renaissance gal. <laughs> um, right now, I am touring stand-up, as you mentioned. I'm writing some potential television, I guess we can call it. <laughs> um, there's just so many varying degrees of, I guess, of everything, of course. But of, yeah. in television writing, I would, I, I'm in the development process. Sure. Um, I'm doing a podcast with my best friend, Mo Welch. It's called Sweethearts. I play Which field hockey. Which Instagram is sweet dot hearts. I know. I think I think that's what whatever we got. Yeah. <laughs> but go to your profile. Yeah. Bell, or Beth and it's Stelling, in my profile. And then it's in there. Yeah. yeah. So people can find it. Yeah. yeah. Two Midwest gals. We started in Chicago together as comics, and I've come a long way. She directed my last Netflix special. Awesome. Um, play field hockey uh, with a local team, the Santa Monica Field Hockey Club, and I play with the U.S. Women's Masters team. Um, and we're figuring out the plans for the World Cup in October, which will be in Cape Town, South Africa. I'm just like, I'm just healing from this turf burn, actually. Before I came, I was putting a little um, neosporin on it. And what else? I'm a, I'm a loving girlfriend. Um, <laughs> a, a fledgling potential, I guess, stepmother. Ooh. And... Um, is that it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Your life. I guess I that like, must I think be that's it. it. <laughs> how do you balance? I mean, because you can't, I guess I'm curious, how can you um, keep a schedule like that? For instance, like the field hockey, how can you be a good teammate for that when you're traveling all the time? I feel like it'd be really inconsistent. Yes, I will say it varies upon season. This one, I wasn't a very good teammate, but I, I normally would, so I would play on like the, and this is our Santa, like uh, West Coast League. I would usually play division one women's and a division two mixed team but i just signed up for division one women's and said i'm not gonna i might be missing some sundays because it's always on sundays that league yeah and i'm sometimes i'll try to take the earliest flight back home and then go straight to the field um which can be tough especially if i'm not feeling well or you know if i'm doing a typical comedy club weekend that's me performing five hours in three days yeah and so as much as it is just talking, this my latest hour is probably the most like physical and voluminous I've been, uh, yeah. and it is sort of taxing. I I put a lot of myself into my work, and um, there's also like a vulnerability factor there. 
yeah. uh, for me personally, sure. where I give so much of myself. It sounds sort of cheesy, but it is personal, my work. And, and I've just noticed that particularly lately that as I age and tour and travel, I'm like, oh, it's kind of getting to me a bit. Sure. I mean, public speaking is like, regardless of if you've done that routine a bunch of times or that particular set, it's still public speaking. It's yeah. like with podcast, every time I'm recording, I'm definitely tired afterwards, much more so than a random conversation that's an hour long. Sure. And because wanna, I'm more aware of the You want to do a good job? Thing. Yeah, there's, yeah. yes. You, there's like in, pressure. In there. fact, for some reason, since we've been doing this, I've noticed like there's several times I'm like, what are you doing with your <laughs> hands? I, I couldn't keep them still. But um, yes, and I will say that translates even to, I remember my first TV writing job, which I was so excited to have. I wasn't sure how, how I was ever going to break into TV writing, if ever. And it was my, the door that opened for me was through stand up. But I noticed myself. So it's like a dream job and really changed my life in the sense that it was a regular payment. Right. And before I had been really relying on stand up as like a, which is very piecemeal, of course, particularly at that time in my career. And I was still working at the cafe and nannying and, but once I got that writing job, I found myself so exhausted at the end of the day, and I felt like I'm just I'm just being funny or trying to be funny sure. all day, and and it's technically like easy, but really I talked to a more experienced writer, and they're like, no, it's like decision fatigue. You're deciding um, whether to add to that thought, whether to bring something new, whether to say something or not say something, you know, I feel like there's a little more pressure too, though, because you're part of a team then you don't want to let other people down. I feel like when you're on your own, like doing your own stand up, you still work with other people, but all the pressure is like, well, if I fail, I'm really failing myself way more than anybody else. But if yes. you're a part of a team, there's that added pressure. Yeah, that's true. Um, and you really, it's, it is a good job and you want to keep it and you want right. to get asked back for another season and, sure. um, or if, 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 if it isn't the right fit, you know, have someone be able to give you a good review after you leave or right. recommendation. For have you been able to do, I know I talked to Dina Hashem, who I'm yeah. sure you're familiar with. She, um, writes for. Was it The Daily Show? I think she writes for The Daily Show. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know if I knew that about it. I got to see her a couple of weeks ago in Morgantown, West Virginia. Oh, we sure. We were both there. Yeah, so she actually, her and her boyfriend came into my shop. I own the skateboard shop in town, kind of randomly. And I talked to her boyfriend for like an hour because cool. he was a skateboarder and they were in town. And I didn't understand like, oh, what are you guys even doing here from New York? And then he just kind of mentioned at the end of the conversation like, oh, yeah, she's, you know, we're in town for her work. And I was like, what? For what? <laughs> He's like, oh, she's performing. And I was like, what? And so they left. And then I like Googled like Eau Claire, New York performer. Like who is, who would that even be? <laughs> and then she popped up and I was like, oh, cool. Yay. You know, and then I DM'd her. I was like, we should do an interview. She's like, I don't have time. Yeah. I was like, shit. <laughs> yeah. That um, usually make that typically yeah. makes sense. Yeah. But she was coming back through Wisconsin. So I ended up uh, driving over to Appleton, which is like a three hour drive, but okay. drove over there and got to interview her a little while ago. But she nice. was saying at least for the daily show, um, that they're really understanding that a lot of those people have things on the weekends. So Fridays they could work remotely or whatever. And yeah. it gave some kind of structure, but she was able to juggle the two like pretty seamlessly. It depends on for sure. It depends on what show you're on. Who's the showrunner, the needs of the show, you know, the size of the staff, all those things. So right. I would say, um, particularly crashing, which was my first writing job for HBO, which was Judd Apatow and started Pete Holmes because it was about stand up, they they allowed and even somewhat encouraged me to keep my tour schedule because sure. it would feed into the stories of the show. Sure. And a lot of things, if you like Google your name, it brings up the Rick and Morty thing because you got to write for Rick and Morty. Mm -hmm. What is it? What is writing? So what does the process look like from when you have an idea for a joke? How does the process go from that until it's actually in the show? Because it goes through multiple people's hands and you know what I mean? It's got to yeah. have a whole process to it. Yes. And every room I would say is different. Um, Rick and Morty wise, uh, I'm trying to, I wrote on season eight, which will be coming up here soon. Oh, cool. um, has it has it not come out yet. Um, I guess it's one of those things where we, we are in, in that particular room. You do come with ideas for several weeks. And because if you are going to be writing an episode, which typically each writer does um, for the season, depending oh, you write on the whole episode, depending on what your contract says, oh, like wow. if it's like, oh, and she'll get an episode, um, then 
you want to care about what you're writing about and have a particular connection to it or be inspired to right. write it. That being said, um, and this is from the mouth of the showrunner, Scott Martyr, who's great, and it's a tough job. Rick and Morty is a really tough job because there's so much... <laughs> obviously a lot of lore and history long history because it's you know that was the eighth season that i was on and not to mention the fans are pretty intense um so anyway the quote from him that i was just leading up to is just television writing is a team sport and i find that to be very true you know everybody's a part of the episode everybody especially at rick and morty was really helpful to me because i was coming in late now obviously i'm a very type a comedian so i watched every single episode before i started i made a excel sheet with everything so i would remember what happened color coordinated it because i don't want to be the person that comes in and pitches stuff that's already happened sure and um i want to do a good job yeah. uh, i wouldn't say that, that rick and morty was the best fit for me just in the sense that i'm not a sci-fi nerd yeah. but i also didn't trick them you know like i was very transparent about that sure and they want all kinds of funny people to come to the show and bring their perspectives yeah so i would say my expertise there is probably more relationship based and just you know joke yeah. writing yeah i guess i didn't realize that for a lot of those shows that each individual episode was a different writer like yeah. I, w- I would think it would be hard for a show to be very seamless yeah when, it, when it's like that even if you do the research you're still coming from a different perspective and background and everything for it to yeah. like still fit and seem like it's written by the same person enough that the average person like myself has no idea like that's pretty impressive and I mean, think about it. Um, you're not there every day. You, know, right. you haven't been there every day. Right, so, yeah. you know, I, my first shop was an ice cream shop. And it's like, <laughs> I've eaten a lot of ice cream. I know how to make a sundae. Yeah. And yet I have to do all the training when I get there. And, you know, like any sure. time you're training for some any sort of job, it's like, just because you watched it, just because you've seen it, doesn't mean you can do it and yeah. live it. I love how I made a scoop. But, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, so there was totally a learning curve. I remember I had a list going of things I like needed to watch yeah. that everyone kept referencing in the room. I mean, and it grew so long, I could have never watched everything. Yeah. But like, I wasn't a, I wasn't a Trekkie. And it's not that everyone there is, but sure. I just wasn't. And so right. there was just, there's no way for me to catch up in that way. Sure. It's almost to me, I guess if I could compare it to anything, it would be like, um, I don't speak Spanish. And, and it's like, I'm being hired on a Spanish speaking show. Oh yeah, yeah. So I can yeah. pitch on things. I can give ideas and stuff, but I can't write a sentence in Spanish that makes sense, you know? Right, yeah, because you only know the surface to a certain degree, yeah. not necessarily everything yeah. you do with So, that. very positive experience for me, yeah. still friends with everybody, but it wasn't exactly, like, I would say, perfect fit, but I cared, and I worked hard, and I wanted to be there. How, how are we going to know which episode it is? It'll have my name on it. Oh, well, yeah. you don't know what number it is or anything yet? Um, I will say, again, every writer's room is different, yeah. but at Rick and Morty, things change a lot, and... Oh, sure. Um, and it is very hands-on. Everyone has a hand in it. So I'm sort of just like, once I'm done in the writer's room, then it will go to be storyboarded. Right. That can change things. Um, yeah, anything that happened after I left the room could change things. Sure. Order. So right now I, I should be the eighth episode, but oh, cool. but I don't really know. All right, we'll keep we'll keep our eyes yeah. peeled. All right, let's get to our <laughs> first. Know, hopefully, it's still there. <laughs> I, yeah, I, yeah, hopefully, right. <laughs> Otherwise, we're we're telling everybody the wrong information. Still go watch, watch the season. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. it will be kind of fun for me too. To yeah, because s- you see know. what happened. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Will you will you see the final product before it goes? No, it won't, yeah, it's not any th- sort of like, hey Beth, you okay with this? It's yeah, just well, sort sure, of like. But, I give my part yeah. and wow. ho- okay. w- wish it the best. You're from the Midwest. You're not from Wisconsin, but I'm you're from, from Ohio, from, Southwest, yeah, from, from Dayton. Dayton. Why did you move to Chicago? Just like that's where theater stuff was. Yeah, I had interned at Steppenwolf Theater Company um, my junior year of college, or in between, you know, right before senior year, and it was a really good experience. And I met a bunch of improvisers and um, thought they were really cool. And I knew I wanted to do stand-up. Um, another guy who grew up in my hometown was on the main stage of Second City, which was a huge deal. Cool. So I got to go see him, and he kind of put me on my stand-up path because I was like, that was so cool, I wanna do that. And he said, do you think you're w- willing to work really hard for almost 10, up could be what 10 years, and maybe still not get this? And I said, I don't know. And he, he said, well, then you should do stand-up. <laughs> cool <laughs> and so i did yeah that was matt craig and 
he's still in entertainment and TV. He's a TV writer. But um, that is where I met another couple uh, musicians from Baraboo who introduced me to Monica. And we must, I, I think we officially met though in LA once she had oh, come sure. out there. She was in Fox, the band P PHOX. Um, and now she's finishing up her solo album. Sweet. Um, and that song that I played, um, also she duets with James Blake. He wanted to do a duet with her. So oh. there's another version of it with him. Rad. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So why did you move to LA? Just the opportunities being there? Because like, there's a lot of theater stuff that happens in Chicago, but I feel like there's not a lot of TV movie stuff in Chicago, is there? Yeah, there is some TV, of course, like Chicago Fire and sure. a couple other things. Um, I moved, so I was, Basically, the impetus for the move was be getting to be a new face of comedy in the Just for Laughs Montreal Festival. Oh, cool. I kind of took it, I mean, definitely something to have taken seriously, but I probably took it like very intensely seriously. Sure. I'm such a rule follower. Yeah. Um, and really, it was kind of their way of saying, like, do you think you'll be moving? Because they want to pick like people who are mm. on their way up. They want to be like discovering people. Right. So that was sort of part of it. They weren't like, you have to move, but sure. I was the only comic in the group from Chicago. Everybody else was in New York and LA. And so that was kind of, that was the reason really. And I'd been in Chicago for four years and I felt, I actually cut, it's funny. I felt old at the time moving to LA. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this is too late. I was like 26. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, a lot of people like the dream or whatever they leave. I mean, I know people, I'm 34 and there's a lot of people that I grew up with where it was like 19. Okay. We got to move to Minneapolis or, oh, I'm going to yeah. move out to California or I'm moving to Seattle or whatever. Right. But yeah. By the time even 26, I mean, I opened my store when I was 23 when I was 26, I was having my second child and I already had a house and was married with a dog and the whole thing. Wow. So it'd be a lot to like uproot and move out there. So yeah, right. I, mean, I can see why that would feel like it's a little bit late, but you've yeah. been out there now a good long time. Do you yeah, think you're going to stay there forever? Yeah. You know, there, there, of course, like the pandemic provided an opportunity for a lot of people to, to leave. Right. And they I went to Austin. The, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people like moved yeah. to Austin. Yeah. Um, some people to Vegas and the taxes for sure are also, um, I think, motivating for a lot of comics that start making a good amount of money. Yeah. Because California taxes really um, screw you. Sure. But um, I, I don't know. I think I would. I'm dating somebody who has who is there and he has kids. And it would be a lot to move. And I don't think either of us really wants to or needs to yet. But I also am open to it. I mean, we both have times. He's a director. We both have times in our career where it's like, should we just move to the woods and yeah. live a happy life? Um, I mean, we're happy, of course, in LA too. And have, but the career can sometimes be taxing. Yeah, entertainment is very, you know, there's an undercurrent undercurrent of uncertainty. So the best thing about there, I'm assuming, is the weather. What's the worst thing about living in LA? Hmm. <laughs> what is the worst thing about living? I guess. I mean, if my silly answer is just dust. It's really dusty. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, there's a lot. It's dusty and grimier. It's a little dirtier. Yeah. Then uh, what part of LA are you? I live in like, I guess you'd call it Beachwood Canyon area. No, 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 no. I mean, that's a little further. I, I always struggle because it's like my neighborhood is like a little bit of a no zone. Sure. Um, Franklin Village. Sorry, I took so long to answer that. <laughs> no, you're good. I just did a lot of interviews out in LA for a while. Okay. And I would stay in like Hollywood area because it was somewhat central. But like Hollywood's I, real grimy. Yeah. I, it's that's basically what I was say. I like New like York it. City in the summer, which is kind of the worst because it reeks of trash. Yeah, you know? everywhere it reeks of trash. Like I was going out there quite a bit because I just had started to build a network out there. So I was like, oh, cool. Like I, yeah. I can text the five people that I know and they'll tell me five other people and I can yeah. go get a bunch of interviews done in a week. And eventually it got really over doing that. And I was like, well, I could just stay here now. Yeah. And people are coming through the area all the time. Yeah. So now the show is more focused on either people that are from the Midwest, live in the Midwest, or who are coming through. So I fine-tuned it a little bit. I had to niche I'm it down after 100, however many episodes at this point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so you're exact perfect fit. <laughs> you do, on your uh, page, you say you have two podcasts, one with your mom, one with your friend. You still do the one with your mom? I haven't done, no. We, we are currently doing new episodes. I've had, I've had a handful of people ask, and I know my mom wants to do it again. Yeah. And she's totally capable. We did it during the um, pandemonium, which kind of like kept us both probably sane and afloat. Yeah. It's just, um, but you know, that's, it's, it's not that 
older people are not capable of doing technology. She did an amazing job, but yeah. it is a lot to ask. Like, um, you know, all of this. Right. It's like, okay, headphones going, press record on voice memos, isolate your sound, you know. And she yeah. she did it all, uploaded to Dropbox. So there was just, she's totally capable of doing it, and I shouldn't use that as an excuse. I know she wants to. I feel like it would be a lot of just time, though, right? Because during the pandemic, everybody yeah. had more time to put into things like that. Totally. But then when all of a sudden you can tour, it's like pretty hard to justify putting your time into a podcast yeah. when you have everything else that's going on that one has more potential for your career than another thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And also too, I mean, we, we, we were with Earwolf for the first maybe season or first two seasons or something. I think we have three, maybe there's just two <laughs> anyway, but essentially it was sort of like there's, we didn't gain enough popularity for them to continue paying us for the podcast. Like, sure. and so that was also kind of part of it. That was like a little sad where my mom, my mom was like, we're canceled, you know? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we got canceled. Um, but but of course, the people who found us loved it. And I've had a couple of people after shows, like, are you going to do any more of those? Yeah, sure. But I'm really proud of what we did. Yeah. It was interesting. It kind of, it was initially just supposed to be me and my mom calling my friend's moms who are, who, who have kids that are in entertainment or comedians. Right. And That's learning awesome about them. That's awesome premise. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to bother my friends, basically. Sure, yeah. And it's a cool way to hear about your, those people. Totally. But I will say we did kind of devolve into learning more about the moms, which is special, sure. too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, um, right. we would kind of get off on a tangent. Yeah. And want, my mom and I are Midwestern, too, and we'd want to give that person their right. time to get to know them and stuff like right. that. But we have lots of episodes I'm proud of. And also some of the moms are no longer with us, and it's kind of like a beautiful little sure. diary entry yeah and something for the kids to always go back and listen to their mom talking about them for sure yeah and sometimes it's okay to just pump the brakes on something because some mm. other opportunity is there like i'm closing my my skateboard shop right now after a little over 10 years because like i just don't have the time to juggle everything that i do anymore yeah and the show has become a bigger focus and something that i'm just more passionate about because how many years can you do the same thing yeah eventually you want to do some other things so but you do have your new podcast because yeah. that is like pretty fresh right there's less than yeah, 10 episodes I, or something we just have i think I think the seventh one maybe just came out. Sure. So what is the actual premise of it? Is it just like two comedians? It's really funny. Like, I mean, the... The, the goal, of course, is just like, oh, two, two comics that are really funny. You know, like, yeah. I guess any reason you want to, if you're a fan of somebody, you're kind of like, oh, here you talk about anything, you know? Sure. Um, but, but the premise is that we're both from the Midwest. We both have that sort of sweet disposition. I have an old joke about my first, like an old first album that was like recorded in a bar. It was called Sweet Beth. He's having a, a, a joke about that. Like um, sure. Joe Kilgallen named me that on the Chicago sweet stand-up Beth. scene. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And, um, but it's also like, I love sweets and candy and so does Mo. So usually we try something, a new candy each week and, and review it or something sweet. Sure. So that's sort of like the hook. Or we talk about anything involving sweet and hearts. How do you do it uh, when you're traveling? Do you do a lot of remote? Or we you haven't just, like, done any remote. Up? We've been stacking. Oh, cool. And I will say the next two I'm scared to even listen to because I was so tired. Oh. I was like, I don't think I'm funny, and I don't know what we talked about. Even this last one was so funny. We really divul- devolved into something a little more sorted than the Sweethearts podcast sure. was established to do. But... Yeah, whatever. It's There's a lot of improv, like though, right? Don't. Yeah. Like, that's kind of... Because I inter- when I interviewed Sam Talent, I was, like, trying to listen to podcasts he had been on. And I... Not, I'm not from the comedy background at all. Mm-hmm. I never understood. I was like, why are why are so many comedians doing podcasts about nothing? I don't get yeah. it at all. And then I was listening to ones, which for me was a little frustrating because I'm like, I want to know your story, dude. Like, that's yeah. why I'm listening you to You kind of wanted <laughs> to have an official... Right, I wanted information. That yeah. was, like, why I was listening and to I it. And I can understand that yeah. feeling. Yeah, well, I mean, depending on what you're trying to get from it, right? Well, and then after that and talking to him... It was like, oh, this is because this is its own comedy thing. It's improv comedy. And that's yeah. why people are listening. And to me, I j- that just never clicked. Like, I didn't yeah. understand that was a thing. I think there's so many ways to podcast, obviously. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. and that's great. Yeah. Um, I think, to your point, it's like, say I wanted to listen. I'm just trying to think of an example. Like, how to buy a home or learn more about that. And you press, I'm going to look on that. And you press play. And it's like, heads up. 
how are you? Yeah, no, I saw some houses. And you're like, eh, where's the info? Right. Which is why like sometimes people prefer that structured, which can be a comedy one too, like Scam Goddess mm-hmm. is a comedy podcast where it's like, here's a scam. What do you think about it? Moving on, you know? Sure. And people like that structure, why people will fall asleep to Law & Order SVU, you know? Yeah, sure. They want that feeling um, of a circular sort of story then there's also people who will say like, yeah, I love this comic and I'll listen to him read the alphabet or read the dictionary is what I meant to say. Yeah, sure. (laughs) Read the alphabet. Do you think it's harder or more of a challenge for you when you're recording a podcast that you don't really know what you're going to talk about versus having structure? Yeah, I mean, we. I think that's what probably bothered me and worries me about my own podcast. I was like, that didn't feel good. We really need to prepare more. And, And... those, the, obviously, our favorite interviews are one where people have prepared. I think that's why Hot Ones, in my opinion, got so popular. Because yeah. Sean Evans was an incredible interviewer, and he was extremely prepared. And that's, unfortunately, rare. Yeah. Well, I, it's there's a whole myriad of reasons why things are the way they are, right? And like the one big life lesson that I've been trying to hammer into my head is just be kind to yourself. Yeah. Because I'm doing the best that I can with yeah. what I have in front of me, you yeah. know, in some interviews, like I was talking to somebody right before I came here, I had somebody in my store and I was like, yeah, I'm going to interview this comedian. He goes, oh, what's the outline for it? And I was like, well, I didn't know I was going to interview her until like a day ago. Yeah. So it's like a little different situation versus like I interviewed Dessa, who's one of my favorite like performers. She's a rapper, singer from Minneapolis who splits time between Minneapolis and New York. I knew about that interview like two months ahead of time. Yeah. So like when I was on vacation, I was driving, I went camping in uh, Australia by myself. Wow. And so I was driving like five hours a day to like see different parts of the country, listening to podcast after podcast after podcast featuring Dessa. So I had like all this information, you yeah, know, this whole yeah, huge swirling. background on it, but I had the time to do it. I don't always have the time to do it. Yeah. And, and I think too, it's like, uh, you know, what I agree with you. You do. I sometimes am very, very hard on myself, just yeah. in general. And I know it bothers my friends. Like it can sometimes drive them nuts. Sure. I mean, it's driving me nuts. So why not drive everybody nuts with yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I am very hard on myself. I'm very much a. Um, even if like, and I don't like seeing that in other people. So, right. <laughs> you know, it's frustrating. I'm What's sure. the most recent thing that you learned? Such as for me, it's been being nice to myself. What's the most recent thing you've learned that's been helpful? Mm. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of one that's like really been applicable. That as much as you can try to, um, this is like kind of two part. The mind is a garden. You have to weed it. Um, you're not just like healed from past difficulties and bad experiences. They can still crop up. And I also think too, my association with certain things and behaviors um, doesn't mean it's the same in every person. So I would just say of my past relationships, I, I really was trying to do a good job of not carrying things over into the new one. That would be the goal yeah. um, is to take each one as a different human being and start. But I think when other things are at play, like, you know, tied to when, when things are tied to other bad experiences, it's hard not to bring that in. Yeah. Well, and you're supposed to learn from past experiences too, right? So then you have to look at what happened and then use those experiences to help you make decisions in the future. But where's that line, exactly. you know, of what things should you carry over and what things shouldn't you? And it's always kind of a blurred thing, right? Cause everything's a spectrum. Yeah. So you don't want to take any bias necessarily, but you don't want to be completely blind to a red flag that you're aware of is a red flag. Totally. What kind of music do you generally listen to? Just like a mixture of everything? Yeah, I know. I guess it is kind of a mixture of everything. I, I, I've so far played, um, well, you heard it, um, one of my <laughs> friends. So I actually do genuinely like a lot of my musician friends' music, which is a good thing. Yeah. Because that, that would be awkward. I guess I was, <laughs> I'm trying to think about if I was a fan first or not. Either way. Yeah. talented and i love them would you ever go on tour with a band because i mean that they monica have... and i have oh okay we've cool. done one little we've done maybe I, I guess it's just been on the road for like two shows together we did sure. madison wisconsin and baroque and um i forget where the other one was sure so you're on a tour Iowa? how many cities are on this tour and how long is the tour right now are you right in the middle of it or at the end of it this or? is the end of oh, this okay. little chunk but i'll pick back up in september okay so and i don't think i don't know if i'll change the tour name or whatever it's always 
I will say, because to me it sounds a little, I don't know what it sounds to be like, well, I'm always on tour. But it, <laughs> it, it does feel like that. Like, yeah. I, it, it seems like a new thing for me to be calling, a, having a tour name. And yeah. I think that's in the social media era because I was touring before you really needed to worry about that as much. And um, I never had a tour name, really. Sure. I mean, I guess maybe I did. I'm trying to think. It just seems like a... But you fly in and out in general a lot. Are you driving this time like a tour driving around the country? This, one, or this you... little leg I did drive, but yeah. I'm going to head back home tomorrow for like two days and then come sure. back to Chicago on Thursday or right. Wednesday. But well, then like what's the difference between a tour and just having a bunch of dates if yeah. you're flying, right? I know. That's kind of what I feel right, like. I yeah. just... Anyway. But... um. This one I'm trying to think was maybe 10 or so cities or something. Sure. I'm trying to imagine the poster in my head. <laughs> but, um, and then sometimes you add one and then the poster's already pinned and you're right. like, I don't yeah. know. How did this one in Eau Claire come to be? Um, I get, I mean, honestly, my agent just brought it to me and said, do you want to tack this on to your Minneapolis show? And I said, sure. sure. Yeah. Cause it's random Sunday. You're yeah. like, why not? Cool. I'll come. Yeah, I'm sure it was Colin who got a hold of your manager. Colin is a genius and the hardest working person I've probably ever met. He started like the comedy scene here in Eau Claire, Clearwater Comedy. Um, man, I don't cool. even know, seven, eight years ago. And he's just like the biggest fan of stand up I've ever met. And he is a stand up comedian as well, okay, cool. but he's just like the biggest fan of stand up ever. Uh, and will bring in. It's just like over the years, he has brought in people knowing like, well, I'm going to lose money on this show because this person's too big for this. Um, but it's okay. Cause I want to see them personally. <laughs> and it's like, Oh my God, dude. <laughs> but because of doing that and building it over time, like we have something really special here in Eau Claire. Eau Claire is not a big enough city to have the like consistent big names in comedy coming through here all the time to like the plus is a tiny little venue. Yeah. I feel like we need a place that seats three times as many people and it would still probably sell out. Yeah. That would be rad. But it's all just because mostly anyways, because of Colin, it's like one person can totally change everything like that. That's uh, all, yeah, I a hundred percent agree. You just need someone to be like passionate about it and care. Totally. And so, is this uh, material that you're going to perform tonight? Is a lot of it stuff from your Netflix special, or are you working on something new? Um, none of it is from the Netflix special. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it's all new since that came out, and um, I was actually toying with the order that I was going to do tonight, maybe, which is interesting. Like I might, f I'm I'm gonna flip the end sure. to the beginning and see how it goes oh cool i don't know yeah. i'm still like i go in and out of like this is set this is rock solid and tight and then i'll have basically last night i i, I say unraveled but i think that's i'm just so tight laced sure. that uh like in fact i became friends with the fan and um we'll message back and forth and stuff and he's very sweet but he also will shoot me straight and he's like dude you say unravel, but like every nobody else can tell we all enjoyed it. Shut sure, up. yeah. You know, so that's what I mean when I'm annoying. Um, <laughs> so any anywho, I guess my point being, I felt like it was like really honed and humming along, yeah. and then that would have been the fourth and fifth show last night, Saturday, of the of the weekend, and I just started like expanding and riffing and letting space. And to me, that's I think that's what that feeling is, where I go. It's not like, oh God, I'm bombing. It's like, that's not funny enough. Shut up, bitch. It's sure. like, the, sorry. It's like the mean person mm -hmm. in my head. That's like, this isn't quick enough. This isn't good enough. Yeah. So, so I am, it's like a tug of war with let's keep growing this material and explore this era and lock it in. Sure. How long is it from like when you start working on this, you're going to perform it however many times before you decide it's ready to be recorded. How long? Does that process take from when you have it first done until it's actually done? Yeah, I would say it varies every time, varies on the opportunity ahead of you yeah. um, or the opportunity you make for yourself. Sure. Um, I felt my last hour was rushed, but I, it that's was all the Netflix set. one? Yeah, it was all set in motion. And so mm -hmm. I just had to do it. Like, yeah. this is it. There you go. That's it. Sure. Um, but people loved it, obviously. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah. And I'm grateful for that. And it just yeah. goes to show again that sometimes my mind is poisonous. Sure. But the one before that girl daddy, I mean, I was very, very meticulous with that was like ready and over, not overworked at all, like cooked. Yeah. Um, and so this one, I'm in the balance again. I'm sort of like, I don't have, 
I, I filmed it at Netflix as a joke festival, like my my boyfriend and his team did. So we would have proof of concept, like it is ready to go. And my uh, my agents and, man- agents and managers were very like, oh, it's awesome, great new hour. We're so they were very pleased with sure. it, which is nice to have that good feedback. So that's why I think I what I just mentioned was like, okay, it's ready to go. Mm-hmm. And then when I started like, I don't want to say pulling threads, but like letting myself go down a couple paths, it didn't shake my confidence in that I could still put something down. Mm -hmm. It was just sort of like, I don't know, should you keep playing or, you know, like it's just, it's just the ebb and flow of all of this. Yeah. And like I said, I might just put the end of the beginning tonight and see how that goes. Yeah. And it's not a self-destructive choice. It's, um, and it, I, I don't know. It's just exploration. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have all these shows lined up anyways, it's like, well, what are you using that time for? Right. What's the to point? To run of- it exactly as it is if I don't have a film date or right. to see what happens. Yeah. You know, I, think- I still want to put on a good show and I always and well, hold yeah, myself sure. to a high yeah. standard. Yeah. But I mean, you're talking about the difference between something being 97% done versus 100% done, right? You're like yeah. tweaking small things where the average audience isn't necessarily going to know they're going to be laughing regardless, having a great time. It's more just for yourself of this is yeah. trying to fine tune it to exactly the way that I want. And it's the same way with like art, any art. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because like I paint a lot of murals and stuff. That's the other part of my career. Cool. And I'll get to a point where I'm like fixing this line over and over and over and over again. Like I just keep going back. This color needs to be perfectly solid. And it's like, no one, nobody else yeah. will notice it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was part of it too. Cause I usually don't like to hit a new, hit a city again if I don't have a full new hour, but I was actually in Minneapolis in October for the festival, which was just two shows. And the, and not everybody can make, like there's so many factors. Yeah. Not everybody yeah. can make that. And everybody, not everybody saw it. It was probably marginally different, but, um, I don't know, depending on what your preference is. Like, there are people who came last night disappointed that I didn't tell the raccoon story from my special. And it's like, the majority of (laughs) people will be disappointed that if I had done something from the special, I think. They want to see something new. So I was already in my head, too, once I figured that out, Mm -hmm. um, that people who came in October, if they're coming again, they're not getting a new hour. Right. But I also find it totally unreasonable for them to expect me to have a new hour nine months later. I think there's a lot of comedians <laughs> that like use jokes from way, way past. I don't think everybody comes out with a whole new hour, do they? Like, I don't know. That's a lot of material to like constantly be coming yeah. out with that much new stuff. Yeah, I don't know the answer really. Um, it usually takes, I would say, I have at least two, two years-ish between specials typically. Okay, so we won't expect this next one for another year and a half at least. Well, even if I did want to put it somewhere, like most places i mean there's always going to be exceptions to the rule but most places right now are like we're booked through 2025 yeah so even if i sold it to them it would be like coming out in 26 sure so that's what happened so before you record it do you already have a home for it or what's the process for well it used that? to be yeah. that way and i wish it were still like that um there's Is it just, just because so like factors. netflix gets so many offers from all these different people kind of a thing or what yeah i think it's also a convenience thing i think they're doing um DoorDash instead of cooking at home. Yeah. And they used to cook at home a yeah, lot. sure. And very extensive, elaborate meals. <laughs> I, I feel like maybe part of that would be just the fact that it's a lot easier to self-produce than it used to be. Technology being easier to get a hold of. It looks better without having a whole huge team. You know what I mean? Like even recording just a podcast like this. You yeah. don't have to have that much equipment for it to look pretty professional. Yeah. And there are, of course, like standards and stuff that I actually don't even fully understand. Yeah. Um, what you need to shoot in for it to be streamable on one of those platforms like Netflix or Amazon or Hulu. And obviously the people making it do. But I, back in the day, it would be like, here's your, o- well, here's your offer for your HBO special. Like I was given my offer and then I showed up and I did my job and I don't own it and it is what it is. Then this Netflix special, I just took it into my own hands and was like, I'm ready. And it kind of came up very fast. I was, a lot was going on in my life. I was writing on Rick and Morty at the time and that's why I kind of felt like, oh gosh, I'm doing both jobs and I could be doing them both better. Um, But, the reason I did it is because the end of the tour ended in my hometown at this theater that I grew up going to, the Victoria sure. Theater. And so it was just was like this perfect storm. And I did that special in one show, one take. And Oh, it was one take. Yeah. Oh, cool. It was just like it all was just leading up to that. And it was like, it's happening. You That's know? a lot of pressure for the one time because from what yeah. I've heard from other comedians, usually they do at least two, right? Yeah. 
Wow. How did your life change after the Netflix one? Because obviously you had a bunch of bigger stuff before that, the HBO Max one and stuff too. But like, I feel like a Netflix special is like kind of almost as big as it gets for something like that. That's where a lot of people are going to discover you. Yeah. And I feel, and I, and it could have a life uh, beyond what it's already happened. You know, like yeah. for some reason, some group could find it and it blows up. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say... I mean, my numbers certainly weren't bad. They, I didn't, I wouldn't say it was a worldwide sensation, you know, <laughs> like of building your fan base, which is like drops in a bucket. You know, yeah. this was maybe like a little poor sure. in my bucket of fans. Do you think it helped with booking shows and different things at larger venues Some, or anything? Sometimes. Um, and just sometimes not. I mean, to me, sure. I've, I feel like. Sit, I mean, I actually, the way I have been opening lately is actually talking about that, oh, cool. which is, uh, I probably won't be doing tonight if I flip it, but Netflix does in your contract, they, it says they won't promote. So, mm. um, you know, that is on you or if you wanted to hire a PR company or something like that, Yeah, I feel excited and happy and, and proud of myself that I got into the top 10 when it first came out. But yeah, it didn't necessarily like blow me up or anything. I feel like that's what a lot of people don't realize though. Like I've met a lot of really successful people in their different like fields and it isn't ever one thing. It's right. just like people discovered you from that one thing, but each, like you're saying the drops in the bucket, each significant thing along the way, which there's a ton of them. Yes. That group of people saw it from that one thing and go, oh, this is what blew you up. It's like, mm-hmm. no, like it's been a pretty steady growth. It's like, for sure. I interviewed Lamorne Morris from that show, New Girl, the guy who plays Winston. Yeah. I interviewed him a long time ago in LA. And at the time he was like by far the most famous person that I interviewed. My audience didn't even go up 10% from that interview. It's not like it jumped all crazy right. was it like helpful absolutely but it's not like overnight yeah. things change no it's it's always like you know very much a marathon and also everybody's perception is different just like you know when you open up your phone your feed is very different than my feed yeah you know like what i'm excited about is not maybe when i first started what my friends were excited about like sure. meaning like i did meltdown which was a show i always wanted to get on or uh in la and my friends didn't care about that of course but or, like and i don't blame them i just mean early days out of college i did chelsea lately and they flipped out sure and i'm not shitting on chelsea lately right. or something but it's like oh i don't it's not that i don't care about that but it's like mm, I, this isn't like even really what i'm good at or what i do in fact right. particularly at that time it was not the greatest arena for me because sure. i was even more subdued and demure yeah. like i was a little shy and so it's like that wasn't a great spot for me. Yeah. It wasn't. It was fine, but also, um, like you're saying, it's just it is. It's definitely like a marathon. It's a series of breaks. Yeah, you have um, to take the opportunities that are in front of you. Yeah, you know, like I interviewed Luca Buffo, who's this French painter, who's like the dude who inspired me to paint. So like. For the, from the beginning, if anyone said, who's your dream guest, it was that dude. So like that whole interview, I'm like, I'm so excited. You do have no yeah. idea. You changed my life. You know what I mean? But like, That's he's amazing. not particularly more famous than like a ton of other people I've interviewed. It's just to me, he was really significant. Yeah, of course. You know what I mean? But with different people that they listen to the show, they're like, I can't believe you interviewed that person. It's like, well, right. that one just like fell into my lap. Right. You know what I mean? But it, it's... You place different significance. So for you, what are some of the goals and things that would still be really exciting for you to happen? Yeah, and and that's a good question because it's like I also trained myself to just almost remain unruffled. Sure. Because you don't want to get too excited about something if it doesn't happen. Yeah, and yeah. you're, you know, you're basically tamping down your feelings to protect yourself. Yeah. But... But you got to celebrate your wins. Yeah, Like totally. that's something I don't do particularly well with. And yeah. I know that's a... A problem. Yeah, I don't do it well either. But I think um, probably um, having a show that I created go to air, like make it make it. And you've written pilots and stuff. Yeah, yeah, and have it be, have it go to series. That would be cool. Something I care about. Yeah. Um, I would love for someone to just offer to buy my special instead of having me sure. shoot it and then sell it to them. The, obviously, the benefit to, to doing that is that I do own my last special, so it could it will hopefully make me what I used to make on an offer over time because I'll sure. own it and keep licensing it. Right. So okay. that's a benefit. Um, yeah, I would love. Yeah, I would just love to get an offer. I would love for my work to reach the right people who like it. Mm. You know, <laughs> that's like an, always an ongoing battle, though, right? Yeah. Like it's hard to 
because it's hard to market or advertise to anybody specific. I was yeah. talking to this in my shop earlier with somebody today because they're like, oh, I've never heard of your store. I was like, I've been here over 10 years. Yeah. Like if you haven't heard about it, I'm on like a bunch of things in this town. Walk around downtown, you'll see my stickers everywhere. It's just yeah. everybody's in their own little bubble. So there isn't like a say, really good place to get a hold of everybody. This bald person, who's that? The lawyer man? Yeah, I Russell so. Nicolay. He is already, everywhere. Yeah, I was going to say, I saw him on my drive-in. Yeah, Nicolay Law. He's got over 400 billboards. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's his marketing team of being like, oh, well, we realize everybody's in their own little bubbles and get their media from different places. You can't just put it on Netflix and then have everybody discover it who would like it. Right. Because there's a ton of people who don't have Netflix. Totally. Meaning you can't just put it on Hulu. Meaning you can't just, and you can't have it on all of them. So you no. just have to be like happy with the success that what, you know, the thing you did does. Yeah. And I think I'm just like, I'm trying to think of any other goals in that realm. I, I've, I've been t- toying in my brain lately with writing a book. I just think sometimes I wonder uh, if we need, if we all need to master all forms of, if you want to put that in entertainment. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah. I, I've thought about that. If I would enjoy that or if, if my would it be like a would novel? translate. Or no, it would be more, um, I guess you could call it a memoir, you know, because sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. my stand up is so personal anyway, it would be right. sort of like an offshoot of that, I think. Yeah. But I think doing anything like that just helps you with the other things that you do anyways. Yeah. Right. It's Cause it pushes you to like think in different ways and to challenge yourself and grow and anything that you do eventually gets old. Yeah. Right. If you're only doing stand up all the time, you're going to lose a lot of the joy for it because that's all you're doing. And yeah. you, you fine tune something and you got it and it just gets boring. Everything is boring. You got to always be changing up. Okay. I always ask this question at the end of every episode because I know we're coming towards the time of your show. We still got a little bit of time. Okay. Um, (laughs) You're not going to jump right on stage, Mm -hmm. but I always ask this on every episode because I think when you do something that you're passionate about for a living, you get to have really unique experiences. Can you Mm -hmm. share a story of a unique experience that happened to you that you're really grateful for, but it only happened because you pursued comedy? Mm. And not just I've traveled all over. Right, right, right. Specific story. That only happened because I was a comedian. Mm-hmm. Wow. I'm sure there's so many. I'm mm-hmm. trying to think right now. One of the ones where it's like, yeah, it's worth not making money for the 10 years of putting myself through that for this. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, I, I'm telling you like, some, I guess this is a, a good example of how many times I've had to, I'm like trying to think of the, in my head, the timeline of like my career where I've had like a spike in my heart rate, sure, you know, like, yeah. oh, that was a moment where I was like, damn, I can't believe I'm here. Yeah. And I feel like you get desensitized to him a little oh. bit. That's why I'm saying is like, you gotta always remember to actually celebrate him Very because I have that. moments where it's like a you know, that thing happened and that was awesome. And I don't know why I didn't like really relish that moment enough. Like I interviewed my favorite all time favorite music artist, like number one streamed artist on Spotify for me is this rapper, son real. He's from Vancouver Mm -hmm. and I'd follow his career forever. And then he finally was going on a tour through the U S and St. Paul was listed, reached out, contacted him like, Oh my God, you know? And he actually was like, yeah, I'm down, whatever. Got to interview him. And then I remember when I was watching the show because he invited me to hang out the whole rest of the night. And I was staring like right at the stage because I'm behind security. And I remember like setting my beer on the stage, watching it and like, like letting it set in. Like I'm hanging out with my favorite music artist in the world right now. And I'm like making money doing this. This is fucking incredible. I got to enjoy this evening. And then I enjoy the shit out of that evening and I'll remember it forever. Yeah. I mean, I guess in that same realm, it would probably be like Bonnaroo. I mean, that's not even actually my if it, that's a funny answer for me because sure. like I don't I'm not like a camping gal that um, I don't know what that enjoys is. dust it's like a it's a music festival oh, okay. that used to happen like I guess it was near Murfreesboro Tennessee yeah but it was just a bunch of comics you're like in the middle of the field most people are camping they actually put us up in a hotel and would shuttle us in sure but it was like red rocks kind of a thing it, it was it's ba- it's, it's like an nature. open field like yeah, in yeah. tennessee cool but yeah i was probably watching eddie vetter play sure um and i agreed to take a little bit of mushrooms from a comic which is again <laughs> very unlike me but sure. you know because i'm just so buttoned up um and like to be in control yeah um but yeah, just a little sparkly around Eddie Vedder. Yeah. And it was just like, I'm glad I'm doing this. I get to do it um, on my own. and Yeah. And you, know. you got to perform there? Yeah. we There was a comedy tent. Wow. I'm trying to think about the comics that year. Um, 
it was called Goddamn Comedy Jam was one of the events that I performed on. <laughs> it's a great name. And I did, um, I, per- I sang Britney Spears one more time, which was a very fun experience. Like karaoke? <laughs> like a live band and I sang it. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I guess I didn't realize you were a singer. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and I did, uh, I do, I, yeah, probably one of the penultimate moments was me doing the splits on stage. I think Josh Adam Myers, the host, will always r- remember that. Um, is there a video of this somewhere we can watch? It probably is. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's online, but, um, a partner in Anchilla was there. I think that was a Pete Davidson year. Judd Apatow was there. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I, the answer is like usually meeting so many cool comedians. Like I can't believe yeah. I get to be around these people that I watched on TV as a kid. Yeah, and I feel like people always have that saying of don't meet your heroes, but overwhelmingly I've had positive experiences with people that I like looked up to or was excited to meet. I yeah. really have not had very many bad experiences at all. And mine are so like, I usually give that person the benefit of the doubt. When I have right, had a yeah. bad experience or whatever you want to call bad, like yeah. I just go, yeah, I would have liked that to be better and them to be better, but sure. like, are they a criminal for that? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, you, you, it's taxing to be on the road. It's taxing to be in front of a lot of people. If you catch yeah. somebody at the wrong moment, yeah. there's a many, a many reasons why they're not their perfect self. There's been plenty of times where I've ran into somebody at a grocery store and I'm just like, yeah, I, I'm going somewhere right this moment. I know I haven't seen you in a while. Sorry. You know? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I probably came across not totally. as great as I would have. Liked. I can think of it. Yes. I ran, I have those moments I replay in my head and still feel bad about. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's, it's a mix of like, it was like, this girl I went to high school with at Christmas time at the airport, Jackie Shem, she's like coming towards me like, bad like this. And I was like, I'm in a rush. And I gave her a hug and it was like two things. One, I feel bad about that moment. And two, like I go, oh, you're not the main character. She, she probably doesn't care. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's well, no, that is something that I've like really had to realize is people do not think about you the vast majority of the time. Yeah. Like they're not, you're not at the front of their mind, maybe for that very brief yeah. moment, but that's it. Okay. You have to get ready for Well, I mean, you're already really yeah. set. I got to pee. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, good thing there's a bathroom right here in the Thank green goodness. room. Um, let's tell everybody one more time where they, where they can find everything. Your Instagram is the main thing to find. Yeah, you, sure. Or? I try to keep everything on there. Beth. Sure. Stelling, S-T-E-L-L-I-N-G. And my website is bethstelling.com and has tour dates on there and info. And Are you on the TikToks? Are you on the any mm, of the other platforms? I do have a TikTok, but I'm... Old. Mostly just the, I'm just mostly on Instagram yeah, I'm myself. Not, yeah, yeah, I'm not a TikToker. And then there is the podcast that yeah. is new and fresh and you got to get everyone to hop over there. And yeah, listen, we've got seven episodes out. What is the it called? Sweet, little, what is it? Sweethearts. Sweethearts pod. Okay, yeah. cool. And on Netflix, it's still available, right? It's still available. And what is it called one more time? If you didn't, excuse me, I burped a little bit. Perfect. If you <laughs> didn't want me then. You're going to want me now. Perfect. You're going to want me now. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on of the show. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Passion Pod. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. We'll see you soon. <laughs>